Jesus has risen. Amen. Amen. We are so glad that you're here to celebrate with us this Easter Sunday morning, this Resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, just want to welcome you if you're here visiting with us. <clears throat> uh, please, please uh, just welcome. Um, there's going to be a, a short, short fellowship. You can pick up refreshments on the way out. We're going to we're going to try to move out into the parking lot, but uh, there's going to be a short time of refreshments after afterwards. There's a lot of uh, information in the bulletin. Please uh, uh, just read through. Softball's happening. Midweek services are coming back, and uh, and we have a special guest next Sunday. So yes. Uh, yeah, this is an awesome day, and I'm, we are so thankful that you're here. If you're visiting with us, in the chair in back of you is a, a visitor card. Please fill it out, turn it in, so we can just have a record of your visit. Uh, our scripture reading today is found in Matthew chapter 28. We'll be reading verses 1 through 6. Let's stand as... Thank you that you are risen and that we serve a risen Savior. Uh, Lord, we are, again, we just are here to celebrate your goodness, your grace, and the mercy that you uh, provide for us, God. We commit this time to you. ask that you just speak to us this day. We pray in Jesus' name. opportunity to sing some of the fantastic hymns of Easter. So in your hymnals, number 215, 216, and 217, all the verses, they'll also be on the wall so you can see them there.
You know, scripture we read this morning, it says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who had been crucified. He is not here. We serve a risen God. We serve a risen Savior. Lord, we are just so thankful that you, uh, years before, all of scripture just testifies of this day, of the resurrection, of the cross. And God, we are here to celebrate. We are here to thank you for what you've done. Uh, God, I just pray that you would uh, just inhabit this place. And each person, God, that you would speak to us and that you would point us uh, to hope, the hope that we find in Christ. So again, Lord, we commit this day to you. Pray for my, my brother, Pastor Chris, that he as he speaks, that you would just... Uh, just clothe him, that you would put words in his mouth to convict, 
to draw us to your grace. And I pray for each one of us, God, that you would give us ears to hear. God, ears to hear and a heart to change. Uh, Lord, again, we just thank you for this day. And we commit this day to you. And we pray, God, that in it and through it, you would be honored. In Jesus' name. He is risen. risen Very good. Very good. Turn with me in your Bibles. It is Easter Sunday morning, but I'm going to take you back to Good Friday, and uh, and then we're going to culminate with uh, Easter Friday or with Easter Sunday as well. This is amazing. I'm up here trying to figure out how to get this thing figured fixed up. So, can somebody, Bob or one of you, can you come up here and figure this out? Oh, there we go. Never mind. All right. This is just the the way to make the pastor look more ridiculous than usual, I suppose, is what it is. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, we're going to be in verses 32 through 43. And then, as I said, we will bring you to the really good news of what happens on Easter Sunday. But you've got to have bad news first in order to really be able to enjoy good news. And so, picking up at verse 39 in Luke chapter 23... And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us also. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said unto him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for that hill that contained three crosses 2,000 years ago. And Lord, on those three crosses we see representatives of how sin is dealt with. And Lord, we pray we see the condition of mankind represented in those three crosses. Lord, we pray that you'd use your word this Resurrection Sunday to illumine, to bring new life to those who may not know you this day, whether here or watching. We praise you, Lord, for this Resurrection Sunday. We thank you, Lord, how very different it was from last year and the joy that we have to be able to assemble together and to be here and to worship. And we praise you, Lord, this building is full. There are people watching from home as well. We pray, Lord, that all over this country, the message of the hope of the risen Savior would go forth, for our land desperately needs it. We pray now these things in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. The story was told about a Southern Gospel group. Uh, they were called the Resurrections. And this takes place back in the early 1970s. And it seems as though this singing group, they were going to be performing that upcoming Sunday at an evening service at a Baptist church in the mountains of western North Carolina. That morning they were performing at a church in Knoxville, Tennessee, and the two and a half, three hour drive was no big deal to uh, finish the one church service, grab some lunch, drive on up, uh, and get up to western North Carolina by 6 p.m. However, there was an unexpected freak storm, snowstorm that closed the pass between North Carolina and Tennessee. Finding a payphone, because there weren't cell phones back there, young people, okay, The group's manager called the pastor to explain that they wouldn't be able to perform that night, and the dejected pastor posted a sign on the doors to the church, the resurrection's canceled. (laughs) I thank God this Easter Sunday morning that the resurrection wasn't canceled, but let me tell you, on Good Friday, it looked like it probably would have been. By 3 o'clock on Good Friday, it looked to all passerbys that sin, death, and the devil had won, but friend, that wasn't the case at all. On Good Friday afternoon, had you been an eyewitness just outside of the city, you would have seen three men dying together on three separate crosses. And those three men, those three crosses, give us important insight into how we are to live our lives and why we're to live those lives. Because, see, the three crosses of Calvary demonstrate three responses to mankind's sin. Easter Sunday, or better yet, Resurrection Sunday, is the most important day in history because Christ was raised from the dead. It makes all the difference. You might wonder, what what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. 
It changes everything. It changes your story. It changes my story. It changes what your story can be. It's a familiar story. I get it. I understand that. I've been preaching this for 33 years now. He died on Jerusalem on a hillside outside of, outside of Jerusalem that Friday before Easter. And as I said, we're going to look at these three different crosses because they demonstrate to us three important responses to mankind's sin and the salvation that's offered in Christ. If you guys are able to put that up on the board, would you? First, we see a cross of rebellion. It's a man dying in sin. If we look back at verse 32, it tells us there, and two others also who were criminals were being led away and put to death with him. And when they came to the place of the skull, Golgotha, they were crucified there with him. And the one says, if you are, verse 37, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. If you are, save yourself. We see in verses 32 through 39, we see a man dying in sin. On this cross, we see a, a bitter and an angry dying man. I've been at the bedside of a lot of people over the years when they have passed away, and I've seen some go gloriously into heaven, and I've seen some bitterly go into hell. Who was this man who was Good Friday's witness at the Savior's side? Well, the Bible defines him by his guilt, calls him a criminal. Verse 32, 33 there. Sadly, we're, we're, we're always amazed at the depth of depravity that mankind can fall to. How many times have you watched in the news or read a paper, even in this past week, you find yourself shaking your head at the evil that is rampant in our world today? Many people were horrified this past week. An a, a, a elderly Asian woman attacked on the streets of New York while going to church on a Sunday morning. Or a, a mother of six shot in her car because some jerks got road rage and fires a bullet into a car. Or just closer to home, a 10-year-old girl is found dead that they've been looking for for months. It's so sad, it's so disheartening, what we see around us. And yet we recognize verse 39 gives us insight into this man's soul. This condemned man joins the contemptuous of the taunts of, of those who were against Christ. It wasn't enough that, that Christ had been falsely charged. It wasn't enough that he'd been convicted of a crime that he hadn't committed. It wasn't enough that he'd been beaten within an inch of his life. It wasn't enough that he had to suffer the indignity of being nude while hanging upon the cross, having his garments divided by his captors. It wasn't enough that he was nailed through his wrists and through his, his, uh, his feet, his ankles. Now hanging between heaven and earth, suspended as it is in uh, space and time, He's insulted by the passerbys, but he's also insulted by the people on either side of him who are suffering the same fate. What do we know about this man? Well, the Bible doesn't name him. Tradition calls him Gestus. Maybe or may not be. We don't know. What was he like as a little boy? We don't know. When did he start his life of crime? Early, late? We don't know. What was the first criminal act he undertook? Was it the one he was caught and being crucified for? I doubt it. What was his family like? An abusive father? Absent father? I don't know. Did he have a wife? Did he have children? We don't know. All we know is he had a mother. A mother who brought him into this world. Gestus, if we can call him that, had violated the law. Like the old song says, the law won. The law had convicted and condemned him for his violation, and now he was being put to death for his crimes. Even in an era that was so much more callous than what ours is today, so much less hygienic, so much less clean, and, and all the rest of that, the crucifixion was a cruel punishment. The Romans usually limited mainly to slaves and rebels, and enough Jews were dying of crucifixion that a guild of women had been formed to be able to bring a, a drink to the men who would be dying on the cross in order to stupefy them so that they wouldn't feel the pain. And of course, that's what Christ rejects uh, while he is on the cross. What do you and I have in common with this criminal dying on the cross of rebellion? I find in just an initial glance, I have at least four items in common with this man. You do too. We are profane like this man was. The definition of profane isn't necessarily I use swear words. 
Profane is to treat something sacred with irreverence or with contempt. The vast majority of the world today are going to be treating the resurrection of Christ, the, the most important day in history, with contempt or with irre irreverence or with irrelevance. Profane is the man's response to Christ upon the cross. It's profane when in debate over a recent piece of, of legislation, a representative in our, in our country today, in our highest house, says, what, what does any religious tradition, uh, what does God's will have to do with anything in this Congress? That's the idea, that's the mindset that we have so much today. You can have your faith, just stuff it in your closet and keep it there and don't come out with it. Profane is seen that the second person of the Trinity came to earth voluntarily, was delivered up for your and my sin, and we ignore it like it didn't happen. Profane is continuing ignoring it. You say, Chris, you're preaching to the choir here today. I know that. I know you're here. You're not ignoring it. But we're guilty like this man was. You say, wait a minute, Chris, I, I've never committed any crime that you've been caught for. <laughs> right? You and I are guilty of crimes in the eyes of the Lord, even if you haven't broken the laws of man. And I doubt very seriously that any of us here today have, including myself. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin and its death. You say to yourself, but I've worked hard. I provided for my family. I've never stolen from another. I've never committed murder. Every single one of us has broken the moral law of God at some point in our lives. Period. Well, yeah, but pastor, I'm better than. Tough news is that God doesn't grade on a curve. I was so grateful when I was in college that some of the professors you'd find would grade on a curve. You just loved those professors, didn't you? God doesn't grade on a curve. God grades on the absolute standard of holiness and purity. And thank God, when we couldn't do that, when we couldn't meet that standard, he sent Christ. As this man was being punished one day, we will too, if we are outside of Christ. This man's punishment was taking the full effect of Roman law, and it was going to be meted out in a matter of hours, and then this man's life would be over, he would be dead, and the full effect of Roman law would be met, because that sin would be punished. But that's not how God deals with sin. It doesn't just end in 24 hours. We either suffer eternally, or we take the perfect provision of Jesus Christ for all of eternity. Amen. Fourth, we're prisoners of death, just as this man was. This man was nailed to the instrument of his own demise. He was a prisoner of death. He could not get away. He couldn't pull himself off that cross. The older I get, the more I realize we all have an appointment with destiny. Pastor Zach spoke about that on Friday night. We all have that day of appointment, which we will graduate from this life to the next. You remember Jacob Marley and Dickens is a Christmas Carol. When Marley's ghost comes, he's, he's wrapped still in chains, right? And, and you hear him coming. Why? Because he's a prisoner of his past. Even in eternity, he is a prisoner of his past. What's your past today that's enslaving you? Turn it to Christ. He's the chain breaker. Turn it to Christ. He's the one that gives you and me freedom. He's the one that gives us new life in Christ. Are you a criminal dying on the cross of rebellion? Do you remember, it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie or in the musical Les Mis. It is one of the greatest portrayals of redemption in musicals or moviedom or, you know, whatever. And when Jean Valjean, who has sinned and yet he accepts grace and redemption and he attempts to make something of his life, and that movie follows him even though there's that guy Javert, right? Javert, all he wants to do is grind him into the ground because he's about the law and all about the law and about his own supposed righteousness. And what ends up happening, grace liberates you, but the law kills you and condemns you. We've all violated the law, every single one of us. 
That's why we need the grace of Christ, because it's humbling and it's also life-changing. The first cross is a cross of rebellion with a man dying in sin. All of us can relate to that. The second cross that we see is found in verses 40 through 43. And this is the cross of repentance, and it's a man dying to sin. Look at verses 40 through 43. But the other answered in rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. So on this cross we see a man dying to sin. Who was this man positioned on the other side of the Savior? Like the other man, the, the Bible defines this man not by his name but by his guilt criminal bible's kind of harsh that way isn't it it takes all of our education all of our heritage all of our wealth all of our honors and it reduces us to two classes of people sinner or saved christianity is the great equalizer in the world we don't recognize class, we don't recognize race, we don't recognize education, we don't recognize importance, value, honors, we don't recognize you're either saved or you're not saved. Amen. That's why we can be a church like we are, with all sorts of people from all sorts of places. And we get along, for the most part. Right? <laughs> Individuals have surrendered their lives to Christ in all sorts of places. Not just churches on Easter Sunday morning. The revivalist uh, uh, Finney, Charles Finney, got converted in the woods by himself. John Newton, the author of the hymn Amazing Grace, repented while he was lashed to the uh, wheel of a ship in a storm. Chuck Colson, the founder of Prison Fellowship, asked God into his life while crying in a friend's driveway about to be sent up for his part in Watergate. C.S. Lewis, one of the most interesting conversions of all, took place while riding in the sidecar of his brother's motorcycle while they were on the way to the zoo. I've always said his brother was an alcoholic. I always wondered if his brother's drink had influenced what the ride was like that day, and he prayed that way. This man was converted on a cross. What do we know about this man? Again, like all the other criminals, the Bible doesn't give his name, but gives his offense. And it doesn't really matter how he ended up the on the cross, just like this previous man, but he did. And he began by condemning and criticizing Christ. And then some point along the way, we don't know when, we don't know where, but on that awful day, a change began to take place in his life and grace began to quicken his heart. They quickened his soul, and he responded to life in the face of death. You know what? This past week, as I was going over this message, as I was preparing, I thought to myself, I had an original thought this past week, original me. I thought, this man, I've never heard it said before. It probably has been said. I'm sure Chuck Swindoll or somebody important has said it before. I believe this man had the greatest faith of anybody that's ever been, uh, that was ever in the Bible. Think about it. People who, when Christ was alive, were putting their faith in him because he was doing this miracle or that miracle. We are on this side of the cross. We've seen Christ raised from the dead. So we can put our faith in him. You know, it, it's not uncommon that people are facing death. They put their faith in Christ. Uh, when your back is against the wall, there's no place out. You, you, you put your faith in Christ. When you're in a foxhole, you put your faith in Christ. But I don't think there's ever been anybody else in all of history, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that put their faith in Christ while on the cross looking to the Savior who was dying as well. Amen. Now that takes faith. Amen. I'm going to put my faith in the guy who said he was going to be Messiah, who was going to rise from the dead. I'm going to put my faith in him while I am tied to this cross. I'm dying on this cross. And it looks for all the world that he's dying too. The whole world viewed Christ as an abject failure while he was dying on the cross, except this man. He was looking to him for redemption. 
He was looking to him for salvation. You know why? Because there was no plan B for this man. As long as you and I have a plan B, we feel as like we're, we're in control of our destiny. When there is no plan B, we throw ourselves at the mercy of Christ. And friend, Christ always comes through when you do. What do we have in common with this man? Friend, you can find salvation in Christ just like this penitent thief did. What did he do? Well, first of all, he prayed. Verse 23, or chapter 23, verse 42. It was a simple prayer, a prayer of humility and faith, a spoken prayer, so as to speak. He was pardoned. He had a change of heart about who Christ was. He sought for and he was granted forgiveness. I am so glad that the person who I thought Christ was as a 17-year-old was not the same person who Christ was when I was 18. Guess what? Christ didn't change. My perception of him changed. What's your perception of Christ? Who is Christ? If you call out to him, you'll be pardoned. You'll be forgiven. Back in 2013... Governor, then Governor Terry Branstad commuted the life sentence of Raspberry Williams. Williams was then a 66-year-old who had served almost 40 years of a life sentence for first-degree murder after shooting a neighbor over a $30 debt from a Waterloo, Iowa pool hall. The governor's decision was approved by the Board of Parole unanimously, by the prison warden, by the prosecution who convicted him and the judge who oversaw his trial. Why? Even the very family of the one he had killed were in agreement with his sentence being commuted or paroled. During the decades of incarceration, Williams had mentored younger prisoners. In one heroic act, he had saved the lives of two guards at Fort Madison who were being held in a hostage situation. What changed the man? He got his high school diploma? Well, he got his high school diploma. That didn't change the man. He learned to trade. Yeah, he learned to trade. It didn't change the man. He had nice guards, or maybe, but didn't change the man. What changed the man was he found Christ in prison. And it changed his life. And it changed him radically. So much so that, as I said, even the family of the victim forgave him and agreed that he was such a changed man that he should be given pardon. Well, this man also was promoted. Jesus' response to this hopeless man is, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Think about that. A hell-deserving sinner one moment. Somebody with your passport stamp for heaven the next. A grace-given saint in a moment's time. That's a promotion. That's a promotion. Friend, realize that the cross, that this cross teaches lessons for you and me. I thank God that there is no place on this earth, and the, the early astronauts admitted there wasn't any place outside of this earth, too, where the grace of God could not reach. Maybe you were converted in college. Maybe you are converted in an army base. Maybe in an accident, maybe while driving in a car, maybe at a revival meeting, maybe in a hospital bed, maybe in a Bible study, maybe in a bar. Several of you have been converted in baptism class. You came because you want to be baptized. You realize you need to be saved first. I can see about three or four of you here today that that happened to. Where sin aboundeth, grace aboundeth all the more. A thief on a cross accepting Jesus in the last moments of life and getting to go to eternity in heaven? Some people don't like that. It just doesn't set right with them. They don't, they don't think it's fair that a person can live a terrible life of sin and in the final hours of their life, they can receive mercy and get off scot-free. They can get the same reward that a person who's been serving the Lord for decades. Let me blow up. One misconception. Salvation has never been about fair. It's never been about fair. Amen. It's not about fair. It's about mercy. Amen. It's about grace. And it is so great to know that no matter what the offense is that you've had, no matter the depth of despair that your life has been in the past, 
you like this man, me like this man on the cross can look to Christ even in the last moments and say, Lord Jesus, save me. Is there a place for someone even as bad as me in heaven? And Christ will always say, of course there is. There's always room for one more. There's no filled occupancy on the sign in heaven. Are you like the second criminal? Do you recognize your sin? Do you recognize your need for a savior? That's fantastic. Well, third and finally, we see the cross of redemption, a man dying for sin. Look at verses 44 through 47. And now it was about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. So translated, that's, that's from noon until three, okay? Because of the time that they were using. The sun being obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus crying out in a loud voice, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last Notice the first testimony. And when the centurion saw what happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the multitude who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who were accompanying him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. On that central cross, which was the focal cross of Calvary, was a man dying in the midst of criminals, but he was a man not dying in sin, not dying to sin, but dying for sin. He's the only person that's ever died for your sin, for my sin. On that central cross, we see a man dying for sin, a man, this man's dying in the midst of these criminals. And we see in verse 47, a battle-hardened symbol of Rome, the overseer of the execution, the centurion, declares this man is innocent. Golgotha was probably just a small hill outside of the walls of ancient Jerusalem. The name Golgotha came from a kind of a transliteration of the Aramaic word Golgotha. It meant a place of the skull, and when St. Jerome translated these verse, uh, the verses into Latin, he used the Latin word for a skull, Calvaria. So that's why sometimes you'll hear it said Calvary, sometimes you'll hear it Golgotha. Gospels don't say why Golgotha was called the place of the skull, but a lot of people say that it kind of looks like that. It wasn't uncommon to see a man dying on a cross, but the central cross on this day drew everyone's attention because of the claims. Prophet, teacher, rabbi, messiah. What do we know about this man? Well, the cross has always borne a, a simple and very direct message. There is something wrong with the human race, and there's something that must be done about our condition. We are, to use the popular expression, we are dysfunctional. We are so wrapped and tangled into our own iniquity, there's no amount of therapy can unravel us because we need a Savior. They can be helpful. I'm not saying that, but we need a Savior. We need a cross. We need Christ dying for us. We know a great deal about this man. More than has ever been written in the annals of human history has been written about this man, the person of Jesus Christ. More than any other individual that has ever trod the soil of this earth. More books have been devoted to his 33 short years than the combined biographies and autobiographies of all the United States presidents. He's the Alpha, he's the Omega, he's the beginning, he's the end, he's the Son of God, he's the Son of David, he's the Son of Man, he's the Messiah, he's the Prince of Peace. He's the Lord of creation, he's the Redeemer, he's the second person of the Trinity, he is the Lion of Judah, he is the second Adam, he's the firstborn from the dead, he has the most beautiful title that has ever been given to anyone, he is Savior. Amen. Amen. And with all of that in his curriculum vitae, Resume, volitionally, he chose to go to the cross if it would have only been you or me. The cross demonstrates God's love in Christ. All four Gospels record the death of Christ under Pontius Pilate. All that is recorded there in Scripture. It, it records the establishment of the new covenant in Christ's blood. 
It records that Satan has been defeated, that death has been defeated. The central cross, friend, don't ever forget about it, was a cross of love. Amen. Love. Amen. Christ loves you. Amen. God loves you. Amen. It, it, as I said, if you'd been the only one, Christ would have died for you. Back in the Middle Ages, a, a well-known monk was going to give a, a Good Friday message. And the townspeople came out to the church and maybe it's because he was a monk, I don't know. He didn't say anything. He just went up to the cross and with his, with his candle, he illumined the crown of thorns. And he illumined the hands and he illumined the marks that the, the, the spear had pierced on the body. And in that hush that fell, he blew out the candle and people walked away realizing that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As the second criminal looked on, he believed. He looked on, he believed. The, the sight of the master won him. The sight of the Lord in agony and shame and death, barely a word being spoken between them, draws this man. Well, friends, the resurrection made it all the reality. And I don't want to leave you a good Friday. I want you to turn over, if you're following in your Bibles, to Luke chapter 24 and verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood before them in dazzling appearance. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Jesus talked about the fact that he was going to be crucified. He also talked about the fact that he was going to rise again in three days. It's easy for all, all of us to predict that we're going to die one day. The hard part is saying three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. But that's exactly what Christ did. And the gospel writers record that Christ's tomb was empty. The stone had been rolled away. And why does it matter? Because doesn't simply dying on a cross suffice? No. The resurrection is essential. The bodily resurrection of Christ is absolutely essential because it means that his sacrificial death on the cross was sufficient and therefore, our sins can be forgiven. Anyone's sins can be forgiven. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. The Bible had prophesied it. The Bible had predicted it. And guess what? It happened. Second, Jesus' resurrection means that death is defeated once and for all. As Peter proclaimed that the day of Pentecost, God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Death lost its grip when it tried to take hold of Jesus. The resurrection means that Jesus not only defeated death for himself, but as our first fruits, as the second Adam, he defeated it for us as well. Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole of history of the universe. But as I said, as the first fruits, he's the pioneer of life. He kicked in the door of death. And guess what, friend? One day, whether we... Uh, go to be with him, uh, or he comes to be with us before that, before we pass away, uh, death will not have hold over you. Jesus' resurrection also means that this material world matters. When Jesus came out of the tomb, he came out in a physical body, not a material force. It wasn't some George Lucas film going on or whatever. He came out bodily with his stamp of approval upon it. 
lest there be any misunderstanding, when the apostle said that Jesus rose again, he said bodily he came out. He said there were 500 people, at least, that witnessed it. And, uh, you know, a, a phantom doesn't eat breakfast, by the way, either. Flesh and bone, human beings do. The resurrection sealed the deal. It confirmed what he said to be true. It validated that everything he had said was true. And it makes all the difference today. Let's go back to those crosses as I close. Three crosses, the one in the middle, that's not your choice of which you're going to be. That's your choice for your Savior if you want him or not. You can either be like the one dying in sin or you can be like the other dying to sin. I want to close with a little story that hopefully illustrates that a little bit. In the middle 19, uh, in the middle 1800s, there was a very famous American actor, a very famous American actor by the name of Edwin Thomas. At age 15, he, he made his stage debut. He immediately became one of the premier Shakespearean actors in the United States. He was so popular, he performed in the Hamlet in, in New York, and, and for 100 consecutive nights, he, he performed one of Shakespeare's plays. The critics in London, who were usually pretty hard on American actors, loved him. He actually performed in London as well. Edwin Thomas was a master of tragedy on stage. Tragedy was his hallmark, or trademark, you might say. Edwin had two brothers who were also actors, John and Junius. In 1863, the three brothers performed Julius Caesar. John portrayed Brutus, Caesar's assassin, in an ironic twist that foreshadowed what would transpire just about two years later. In April of 65, John became a real-life assassin, stealing into Ford's theater. He snuck in to the booth where the president and Mrs. Lincoln and a couple of other people were and put the bullet in the brain that ended the president's life. Edwin Thomas and John Wilkes, as you now may surmise, his last names were Booth. Shame from his brother's crime drove Edwin into early retirement. And yet an unlikely twist of fate was about to take place in New Jersey at a train station that would change the course of Edwin Booth's life for the remaining years that he had. Booth was waiting for his train when a well-dressed young man Pushed by the swell of the crowd, lost his footing and fell from the platform in front of the line where the moving train was coming. Booth, springing into action, locked his leg around a rail, grabbed and pulled the man up to safety. The young man recognized his rescuer, but Booth was unacquainted with the man he rescued. Weeks later, however, he received a letter from the secretary of then-president U.S. Grant that Booth learned he had saved the life of Robert Todd Lincoln, the son of the man his brother had murdered. Booth carried that letter in his vest pocket to the day of his death. Isn't it ironic? Edwin Thomas Booth, John Wilkes Booth. One killed the president, the other saved the president's son's life. Same father, same mother, same profession, same passion, Yet one chose to give death, the other chose to accept life. Two men on a cross. One chose life, one chose death. What do you choose today? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this Easter Sunday that you have defeated death. That your Son, our Savior, is a risen Lord and Savior. That, Lord, we would recognize today that we really are one of two people. We're either the person who's going to ignore or blaspheme the name of Christ, or we're the person that's going to accept what Christ has done with open arms and gratitude. So, Lord, as we leave from this place today, might we go forth with the joy that is ours of knowing that Christ is raised from the dead. If we are here today and we haven't personalized that, might we pray right now and look to you, ask you to come into our lives and forgive us of our sins. For we pray this now in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Praise God. Uh, just after we pray, again, there's going to be uh, some cookies, some treats on the way out as you're leaving this morning. We thank you for being with us here this morning, and uh, we pray that you'll be, uh, that God will be glorified through today. And we praise you again for the resurrection of Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you are raised bodily and victoriously over the grave. 
As we go forth from this place today, Lord, might we go forth with the joy that is ours for knowing Christ is risen, that he is risen indeed. We pray now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen.